Cannibal Holocaust. What a great, but shocking and controversial, yet original, well-written, and powerful film. Right, Barnaby? Uh, yeah, definitely one of the most controversial films ever made. Uh, <laughs> of course. Banned in the, 60 um, countries. That poll. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, the director got, like, sued, remember, for killing his actors. And he's like, oh, yeah, they're actually dead. And they're like, oh, you're gonna get sued. Oh, wait, let me bring them back from, like, Hawaii <laughs> or whatever. I think they were just, like, holed up in some apartment in New York. Maybe, that's possible. That's kind of abuse. <laughs> I think it was in their contract when yeah, they probably, probably, signed probably. on for the film. But, like, uh, that's so... When was it made? 1970? Mm, something. Yeah. Well, it was the 70s, obviously. It's it's very typical of Italian 70s cinema. Well, of course. <laughs> Dario Argento and everybody. Like, all the cannibal films were like, oh, we have an animal. Let's just kill it. Yeah. <laughs> it's realistic. I know, it's horrible. What's up with Italians, right? Yeah, I just don't watch those films. Yeah, I, you do. What are you talking about? You always watch those. Yeah, I <laughs> no, but I try to avoid those kind of films where they kill the animals. Oh, okay. So, um, I watched Heat again the other day. Ah, Heat. So, um, yeah, Al, you know, um, I'm gonna just keep running because, um, you know, we're sitting in this cafe at night and then, uh, I'm from L.A. and then you're from out of town, but then, uh, or it's the other way around, I don't remember, but, uh, you know what I mean? I'm Robert De Niro and then, uh, I'm a criminal and you're a cop. I'm just gonna keep running, man, because, uh, that's what I do, you know, uh, that's life. So, you can catch me if you want, but, uh, I'm just gonna keep running, you know what I'm saying? She's got a great ass! <laughs> nice. <laughs> so welcome to the first ever other type of episode of our show, the review episode. My name is Daniel Blumensev, and joining me is Barnaby Folk. This is that episode where we review the films we have seen this month. We will be talking about four films that we have watched this month that we specifically decided to talk about for this episode. And one person is going to start off with a little synopsis of the film, and then we're going to give our opinion of the film. And then the other person is going to give his opinion, and then we will give the film a rating. We will give percentages in tens. And also, we will say if we recommend this movie, so if it should be watched in cinemas, if we say you should wait, so if you can just watch it on DVD when it comes out, or if it's not worth watching at all. So three out of the four films that we're reviewing today are actually biopics. So what we're going to do is first we're going to talk about the non-biopic and then we're going to get to the biopics. By the way, Barnaby, what's your overall opinion on biopics? I think they can either be presented really, really well or really, really badly. I'm going to say we will see an example of a very good one. Then we'll see an example of two not bad, but questionable <laughs> biopics. Yeah, I would say a very, very good example a good example, kind of, and an okay example. Okay, so what I think about biopics is that I think modern biopics aren't so good, whereas before, biopics were really amazing. Just to name a few, Raging Bull, Goodfellas, those are amazing biopics, and they are biopics if you think about it. But now, a recently good biopic is one film that we're about to review, Walk the Line, and Ray, who Jamie Foxx, was a rather good biopic. So our first film is Ida, the Polish Pavel Pawlikowski directed film about Anna, a young nun in 1960s Poland who was on the verge to take her vows to become a nun when she discovers a dark family secret dating back to the years of the Nazi occupation. What I primarily think of Ida is that this was just a cinematically beautiful film. And not just beautiful, but that its framing and its shot composition actually had meaning and it added information to the story. Such as were the cameras top heavy, thus making the characters isolated in one corner at the bottom of the screen. So I think this is really powerful framing technique because it shows primarily that these characters are not in control of the actual scene. Like if they were being in control, it would be wise to shoot a close up of them. But these characters are not powerful and they're just dragged to his side so they're not in control of the scene and of what's going on such as Ida and her aunt and all the cinematography was really 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 beautiful beautiful black and white cinematography which is really effective really well shot the story is really really good however there's this one little thing which I didn't really get they didn't really explain who the aunt was and where she was during World War II for example I thought that was kind of unclear but however very beautiful emotional story with really really amazing cinematography that actually deepens the story and adds to the story 
story. Also, a beautiful score, really, really touching, really well directed, well acted. I think it's a very, very good movie. How about you, Barnaby? I agree with most things that you said. I think that where it lacks in the storytelling department and in how it presented the story, it definitely, definitely, definitely makes up for it in how it was shot and how it looks. It's a very, very beautiful film. As you said, the story is eh. No, no, no. Look, look, look. I think the whole point of this movie is that the story is eh because that's the whole mood and the whole world that you see through Ida's eyes because she was raised in this church her whole life so she hasn't seen the world and it's also really depressing and empty because World War II recently just ended so a lot of Jews were murdered or persecuted so I think the story is actually good except for that one small thing that I talked about. Uh, well, anyway, I think it's more focused on how it looks and how it's shot and everything. I think it's primarily about the cinematography this movie. Yeah, I think it's yeah. primarily about that, and usually that would be a bad thing, where it goes over style over substance, but I think it works with this. No, no, look, here it works because the style is the substance. The style adds to the substance. Usually it would be a bad thing, like a college movie where someone's trying to be super artsy but I think this works because you can tell the people who made it know what they're doing exactly and I will link you guys to the page that highlights the main beautiful and powerful stills of this film I would give this movie an 80% it's very very good except it does mm. lack in a bit of things but it's really beautiful it's really emotional I would recommend watching it in cinema because obviously it's all about the shots <laughs> and the cinematography here so yeah it's an overall very very good movie I would give it 70 percent really yes wow in the last podcast you were like glorifying this film saying oh, it's so amazing yes i've had more time to think about mm -hmm. it it's a definitely a strong recommendation mm -hmm. but generally when i watch films i usually prefer if there's a more detailed story in it mm -hmm. like dialogue and stuff not even necessarily dialogue just more flow to the story and i thought this film i don't like using this word i hate using this word but pretentious no well with... i completely disagree with you right now because this isn't pretentious because everything it was doing had a purpose. Every single shot just added to the story. It's not doing something stupid to be artsy, but you actually understood what they were doing, so I completely disagree with you. Pretentious is the wrong word. I can't really think of the word right now. It's just way too simple in terms of its storytelling, and you think that it's just a word scene, maybe. You can definitely tell that they knew what they were doing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, You can yeah. tell that they planned each shot. It wasn't coincidental that, as you said, they were on the side of the shot not in the center of the shot. That was definitely intentional. Oh, I hope it was <laughs> It'd be really funny um, if you just did it randomly. It was just a camera problem. The entire movie was just like that. <laughs> We're just reading too much into it. <laughs> yeah. uh, no, but I think, I really hope that that was all intentional because as you said, that makes perfect mm -hmm. sense. Everything was shot well. Again, I'm taking back what I said. I don't mm -hmm. think it's pretentious, but I definitely prefer more story-based things. Okay, I think if you're interested in cinematography and the way you can tell a story through filmmaking, which I really love, then this is a film for you. The Imitation Game, starring Benedict Cumberbatch and Kira Knightley and directed by Morton Tilden. The story of Alan Turning as he tries to crack the Enigma code during World War II. So, as usual, Benedict Cumberbatch just goes all in. Just the range of emotions he portrays in this film is just, he plays this such awkward character, but like, he's got such a strong presence, but he somehow manages to bring around that awkwardness that this character portrays. Unlike characters he's played before, like Sherlock Holmes or Khan in Star Trek 2, he plays such strong, intimidating, really, characters. In this, he just plays such a small man who's just so complicated and has so many things going on. He's just obsessed with cracking Enigma, and you really see his struggles throughout the film and I just think the way it was shot it was really nice it portrays everything really well the direction is amazing I think the script is amazing the acting definitely amazing definitely one of Cumberbatch's best performances and what about you Daniel what did you think so I completely agree with everything you're saying I thought first of all the first three things that are insane about this movie are the script the editing, and Benedict Cumberbatch's performance. The script was, even if it's a really, really harsh and quite depressing and a very complex and serious topic, there are a few jokes in here, like in terms of the character interactions, especially the beginning, were really, really funny, really well written, really great backstory of him as a kid being gay and falling in love with this guy, with his friend, with his best friend, actually, and that actually has a purpose to why his character is so untalkative and autistic, and we really feel for him because of that backstory, and it's really good how it's edited, how it keeps skipping back to that and then it goes forward so as i was saying the script is really really amazing how it's written and it's so funny and it's so touching and one thing is that the beginning of the film starts with that really annoying technique in recent films such as in benjamin button which i actually really like except for that one thing is that it starts with the end the sort of steven spielberg technique of book ending and like book starting the movie which i think is really really annoying and it's really cheesy however here it's done with a purpose because i won't spoil anything but the beginning of how he is in jail actually continues 
continues the story when we get there, which is really good. So it's really, really great, deep scripts and everything like that. The editing, I think, is really, really great. How it jumps back to that very poignant and sad story of him as a kid and how that redeems his character now. Also, one of the most beautiful things about this movie is the performance of Benedict Cumberbatch. There's this one shot towards the end, not spoiling anything, where he just starts to cry and the way he acts and the way he portrays that crying is, oh, it's like tear shedding. It's so sad. And there are multiple moments in this film, unlike one more film, which we're going to talk about, where I was really, really teary. The way it's shot, the way how the camera continues staying on him and that one shot and showing him crying and just him acting and in multiple characters like that. And that was really, really powerful. So I think it's a really, really good movie and the score as well was really really good so yeah i completely agree with what you're saying i would give this movie a 90 a 90 percent and i definitely recommend this movie it should be watched in cinemas very very good film how about you what would you rate it by me i agree 90 and i would definitely recommend definitely go see it in cinemas if anything, just to see Benedict come back from the big screen. Yeah, Benedict Cumberbatch. However, okay, one thing I wanted to just point out is that Kira Knightley's performance? I don't know, it was good, but I don't think she should have been nominated for that Oscar. What do you think? Uh, it was good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she was good. That's it, I think. Benedict was insane. She was good. <laughs> I think it's also who she was acting across. She was completely drowned out by Benedict. One more thing is that Kira Knightley's character as well wasn't given a lot to portray, you know? That's what I think. So it's a bit unfair that we're judging her like this. Yeah, I would definitely recommend to see this film in cinema. If anything, to see Benedict on yeah. the big screen mm. in an actual <laughs> good film, definitely see The Imitation Game. And staying with World War II, our third film is Angelina Jolie's Unbroken, the biopic about the Olympian runner Louis Zamperini, who, after a near-fatal plane crash in World War II, spent a harrowing 47 days in a raft with two fellow crewmen before he's caught by the Japanese Navy and sent to a prison camp of war. So, my thoughts when walking into Unbroken were, this is Angelina Jolie's second directorial feature after In the Land of Blood and Honey, and after that movie, I thought, okay, so Angelina Jolie is not the greatest director of all time, so this is gonna be okay. Okay, I really thought that the story won't be so coherent, like that it'll portray just certain aspects of this guy's life without a string of a story, without everything being tied together. However, it was written by the Coen bros and two other people, so I was like, okay, it should be pretty good. And also I thought the acting would be kind of bad and it just wouldn't be very good. It would be kind of cringeworthy, I thought. However, after watching this movie, I was quite pleasantly surprised. The first word that comes to mind is that this was very, very entertaining. I must say, congratulations, Angelina Jolie. You have made a mediocre movie. The greatest thing about this movie is really the cinematography and the script. The script isn't amazing, but it does join all of the aspects of the film, all of the events together, so that's really good. The cinematography by Roger Deakins, of course, is really beautiful, and Angelina Jolie's directing was fine. The acting was okay. Okay, here's the problem. The trailer and the promotional stills for this movie were just really, really bad. <laughs> Certain scenes that they showed in the trailer were really cringeworthy. That's probably my main reason why my opinion at first was a bit different. However, I really enjoyed this movie. I think if you just want to be entertained and to have a nice time at the cinema, this is a pretty mediocre movie. It's not bad and it's not amazing. The acting is okay, as I already said. The story is fine. So yeah, that's what I thought about Unbroken. What about you, Burnaby? <laughs> Ah, dear. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. Unbroken. I am sorry, Daniel. I didn't like this film. <laughs> Let's put it this way. Both Imitation Game and Unbroken are about a character, one character, mm -hmm. and you go with them through their life. I think with Imitation Game, I cared about Ben Cumberbatch's character. In Unbroken, I feel awful. I feel so awful because I know the guy this is based off suffered so much. I didn't care. I just didn't care about him. I didn't. I didn't. I just going through his life. I just thought, God, he's boring. Okay, look, look. I agree with you. I agree with you that this guy is not the most interesting. However, you forgot the element in the script where in the beginning, he himself thought that he was nothing. He thought he was nothing, but like, obviously he's not. He shows that through the film, that he's not nothing. And I just thought in the prison camp, like, God, I don't care that he's going through this. The main Japanese general I thought was so miscast. <laughs> he just looked like a girl. <laughs> he was like a school bully. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> he was so young. I think that role, should someone should be older for that role. His acting was fine, like everything else in the movie. He was so petty. I don't know if he was written that way or was the guy who showed it, but he was so petty. He was like a school bully. But you're forgetting that this is a true story, and then this is written by two masters of cinema, Joel and Ethan Cohen. so I think they know what they're talking about. It didn't feel like a Coen Brothers film. Well, I, I think it looked like a Coen Brothers movie, because it's Roger Deakins. It looked like it, but it didn't feel like it, I Oh, think. yeah. It was fine. Like everything else in the movie, it was just fine, you know? But it was 
very entertaining. I've seen Jack O'Connell in Skins. He's really good. Compared to everyone else, he blows everyone out of the water in that. So I know it's not his fault. I think it's a mixture of both writing and direction because I just didn't care about him. I did not care. Yeah, it's true. Maybe I'm misjudging a bit, but I thought this movie was going to be really, really bad. And then as I was watching it, I was really surprised how good it was. So maybe I didn't consider the fact that it wasn't so good. I mean, and, and I'm, of course, I'm stating that it's not so good, but I think you're being too harsh. I think it was really actually fine. It was pretty good. Uh, well, your opinion. In terms of the production, I think how- Oh, was cinematography was amazing. Yeah. And in terms of how, how it's a big budgeted movie, that was all beautiful. That was really, really well done. Mm. Just the character and the acting and the direction, yeah. I think, just weren't strong. They weren't yeah. bad, but they weren't strong. Maybe it could have used a different director. Well, oh, no, obviously if you use a different director, then it would be really good. No offense, but you know. Ooh, I just had a brainwave. Direction for scenes. Fine. Direction on characters? No. Add more depth to your characters, that's what I'm saying. I would think as an actor... Yeah, she should know about this. Makes no sense. I don't know, this movie, it didn't make me angry. No, 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 not at all. That's what I was really happy about. I thought it was gonna make me go, ugh, like, why am I watching this, you know? But it really didn't! It was really quite good. Yeah, I just didn't get angry. I didn't particularly care. It's not till afterwards that I felt bad about not caring. Yeah. My rating for this movie would be, I'm gonna go kind of with a strange choice. You'll probably really disagree, but I'd give it a good 70%. <laughs> and listen, in terms of if I recommend it, I, I do also recommend it. I really think you should watch it in the cinema because if you just don't really pay attention to the acting, <laughs> it's a pretty entertaining and nice movie. I'm totally for Angelina on this one. Sorry, Barney. Uh, I'm gonna say... A 30. <laughs> no, I'm not gonna be that mean. I'm gonna give it a... 50. Wow, that's horrible. <laughs> I'm gonna give it a 50 nope. because okay. it wasn't awful, it didn't offend me in any way. Different direction. Recasting the prison camp guy. I would say just more depth into the actor's feelings. Time for our final film, The Theory of Everything, directed by James Marsh, which details the relationship between Stephen Hawking and Jane Hawking throughout their lives. I thought the first hour I was just completely left behind. It skipped so much and I was just left behind. I had to think, really think about what's happened in order to connect it in my mind and it just kept moving on and on. And I don't know if you had the same problem. I just felt everything was so disconnected until about an hour, an hour and 20 minutes in when it slowed down and let us look at the characters more. And that's when I thought the film actually got good. So, unlike with Unbroken, I completely agree with you here. <laughs> the first 30 minutes, not so much hour, I would say the first 30 minutes, were just on followable. I literally, I, I couldn't keep up with this movie. I had to think of what I just saw and process that and understand how that affects what's happening now. It was edited like an action movie, I felt. It was just so fast and unfollowable. And this is in a bad way. For example, Paul Thomas Harris, one of my favorite filmmakers, his exuberant movies, the entire film just doesn't stop. That's what I love about it. It's insane. It's amazing. But he does it in the right way. And this is done in the wrong way. <laughs> it's done in the wrong way. Second, two of some of the most important things in filmmaking, the cinematography and editing, was rather off. I'm not sure if you noticed this, Barnaby, but there was a scene in the beginning of the movie where Stephen takes Jane to this outdoor party with fireworks, and there was a scene on the dance floor where it was just a static shot of just people dancing, and then if you blink, well, just like after a second, it cut, and then it was the exact same shot, but the people weren't there anymore. There was just like two people dancing, and it was not done for some effect. I believe it was just a mistake in editing, and as well in the cinematography, there, there was a shot after Stephen Hawking finds out that he has two years to live. He's just sitting in this room and went watching a movie, and it's a shot of him in deep focus, so you see how large the room is, and then Felicity Jones's character comes in, and then she starts speaking to him, and then you see that same shot again with the camera in front of Stephen Hawking, and you see that shot in a shallow focus, however, but the shot just looks different different as if the wall has just moved closer now. I think like his chair was moved to a different angle. <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't notice that. It was really weird. And then one main thing is that there were multiple emotional parts of this movie, but unlike with Imitation Game, you didn't get to experience them with the characters as the characters did because of a not so well deep written script. And you just didn't experience these emotions of these characters. Okay, no spoilers. At the end, Jane something something happens with her and Stephen Hawking. And at that whole scene, I was like, wait a second. I wish I could have just rewinded that because I didn't understand where this catharsis came from. I like Stephen Hawking crying because it just also went kind of fast and then you just couldn't follow it. And yeah, so it was a bad attempt to create emotion, I feel, through the bad filmmaking and the script. Okay, the best thing about this movie is the acting. I think Felicity Jones deserves an Oscar more than Eddie Raymond. Yeah, Barnaby, I completely agree with you. Okay, so Eddie Raymond was really, really good. But Felicity Jones. Jesus. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Just, she was just so good. I was just sitting there and I was like, this actress will go down in acting history. She can act. 
She is really, really, really good. The range of emotions she portrays. I know it's amazing, like falling in love and then feeling unfulfilled and then being heartbroken. And you can see that she is dedicated to keeping him alive and doing everything she can. But also she has these, self like not even selfish moments, but you can tell this is not what she wants to be doing. Yeah, yeah. And you can tell through a really subtle change in her face about what she's feeling. It's so perfect. I agree with you with how it was shot. It wasn't the best, mm -hmm. but there was one shot that was really good, but it was mainly because mm -hmm. of her acting. And that's when Stephen Hawkins is playing with their kids. And the child is saying, Mommy, Mommy, come look, come look. But she's trying to work on something of her own. And it's subtly shown. It's not overly forced in the script or anything. You just see the book, see her writing, and then you see her face as she's trying to work. And you just see, she is dedicated, but she just wants more. I don't know, this film could have been so much better. I know, yeah, I'm saying, because you had these two really brilliant actors, but with a script that just went so fast, and it didn't really go in depth, like with Unbroken, into this character. Felicity Jones shows more emotions and goes more in depth with her portrayal of her character than the script told her to because she's so good. We have no proof of that, but I definitely think that's the case. From the script that we saw, you could really tell that it skipped and didn't go in depth and you couldn't really follow it and it was just not really well written in order to portray the emotions of these characters well enough. The beginning of the relationship is just they meet at the party. They don't really seem to get on that well. She leaves, but then she gives him her phone number. And then they're meeting up. They have one scene together to give the phone number. And then it goes on. And they're like in a relationship. And then he gets diagnosed. And then it's like, I want to spend my life together with you. But it's not really emphasized or anything. It's just a shot. If it wasn't for her, it would be so bland. It'd just be like, I want to spend my life with you. Exactly. And the shot and the shot is bad as well. That's the thing I'm saying. The key story elements aren't really shown, you know, that well. This isn't a play. Yeah, exactly. This is this is like a play. <laughs> this would be great as a play. Oh my god. <laughs> I know. Felicity Jones and with Eddie Redmond. But just with how it's shot, it's just I am in love with you and I want to spend the rest of my life with you. Just to add, seriously, like, even if we're both really hating on this movie, just to stress, the acting is actually mind-blowingly good. I'm being completely dead serious right now. Felicity Jones and Eddie Redmond are both just brilliant. Also, one thing about Stephen Hawking's character, the script is also really weird because after it gets completely paralyzed at that concert and when he loses consciousness and when they revive him, right after that, he is just completely happy and he's making jokes. Did you notice that? How with that speech therapist or whatever lady, it's like right after he just woke up and he realized that he can't speak anymore, but he's just smiling like an idiot, just telling jokes. <laughs> one more thing I want to say. What's bad enough is that this story skips and it's not fluid and it doesn't portray the emotions of these characters well. What was up with that stupid in America scene where he like imagines himself walking and the whole cinematography changes and it's all blue <laughs> and then he just picks up the pencil. I thought that was incredibly cheesy and just unnecessary at all. The film is bad enough. Why can't you just play off the acting? How about his character can see that pen and start crying? He's a great actor, he can do that, you know? That'd be so beautiful. But they put the stupid scene in. If it had been established previously that he has these daydreams, that would have worked. Like if it shows in another scene, he wants to get up and hold his kids. The real problem of this was just how exuberant and how over excessive in terms of the lighting and stuff this was. This was like a Broadway play. If it had shown it a couple more times before, like, oh, the lights change, the directing style. If it had shown it, if it had established this like a couple times before in the film, it would have been fine. This just comes out of nowhere. It's just, whoa, lights. I'll tell you my first reaction. My first reaction was, did he die? <laughs> <laughs> is he in heaven? <laughs> Anyways, what I want to say is that that imaginary scene seemed like it was just taken from filth with James McAvoy. I don't know if you saw filth, <laughs> but for the people who saw filth, I think that's a really funny <laughs> comparison. Oh, my yeah. God. I don't know. What did you think overall? Overall, oh god, <laughs> you know, I thought this was gonna be quite good, but I mean, it was quite good, but just uh, so many worse things were there than the good things, you know? <laughs> okay, because of that absolutely insane acting, I'm gonna be generous again as with Unbroken, I'm gonna give it a 60%. And should you watch it in cinemas? No, you could wait and watch it on DVD. If you're into acting or you just want to see really good acting, I really recommend this movie. This is great. But if you're into storytelling, this movie is horrible. This could be such a bad example. I really, 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 really want to give this film 30, 40 out of 100. But acting alone, I'm giving it a 60. Acting alone is worth seeing this film. Not in cinema. If you're just interested in seeing the acting, I would buy it and study this. But in filmmaking? <laughs> Oh my god. Study this for how not to write and how not to shoot. So, Daniel, how would you rank these films? In order of what you would definitely go see to least 
your recommendations, basically. Mm. So if we just rank them as how good these movies are, mm -hmm. I would definitely, definitely, without question, put... Un uh, I was about to say Unbroken. <laughs> definitely, <laughs> definitely put Imitation Game and Eda on top. I guess I would put Imitation first because overall, with that great script, great direction, great acting, great editing. Well, okay, the cinematography actually was the only thing that was just fine. It was it was good, but it was, it was nothing special. Yeah, it was nothing special, exactly. Uh, with all of those things, especially the performance of Benedict Cumberbatch and of the writing and the editing, I would put this first. Eda is really good it's really close however that story in terms of how it was kind of bland and kind of sort of empty not really but it could have added more explanation to the ant and her however the cinematography completely redeemed it so that's why i would put it second it's a really good boot don't get me wrong theory of everything the third mostly for the acting well actually only for the acting really and the music the music was pretty nice and some parts of the script were good and then finally Unbroken, which, don't get me wrong, Unbroken and Theory are basically like the same movie now that I think about it. I mean, in terms of how good they are. Unbroken was mediocre. However, I thought it was quite good. I'd give it a 70 because it's Angelina Jolie. So yeah, it was not that bad. So I put Unbroken last. What about you? Ooh, okay. Well, there's only one film that I really, really, really liked as a film. As I said, I did enjoy Eda. I did. But I prefer story-based. My God, Imitation Game is a good story. That is, and not just story, I know not, not just story. story, but like as a film, the acting that well. is yeah, yeah. phenomenal. I think definitely, if you're going to see one film from this month, Imitation Game, mm -hmm. definitely. That's then great. Ida, as I said, mm -hmm. story, really good. story, mm, but cinematography-wise, just as a film, wow. Actually, what we said about the theory of everything, don't go see that, mm -hmm. go see how not to make a film, watch this in how to make a film, and how to composite exactly, shots, exactly. and how to make shots have meaning. This is the yeah, film. exactly. How these shots add to the story. The story is in the shots, that's the whole point. Yes, just the way the film is presented. Mm -hmm. Watch it to mm -hmm. know how to make a film. Now I'm gonna really have trouble. Actually, screw it. No, you're right. Theory of Everything third. Mm -hmm. Because, oh, really? because if it was not for Eddie Raymond or Felicity Jones, yeah, Theory of Everything is better. Different people made it. The film. It would be so much better. And then fourth, Unbroken. Now that I think about it, I just didn't like it. <laughs> Look, I, I think you really have to rewatch Unbroken. Unbroken is really, it's fine. It's pretty oh. good, man. Are you excited for Angelina Jolie's new movie with Brad Pitt, By the Sea, or whatever it's called? I have not heard of that. I will check it out. I'm pretty excited for that. <laughs> <laughs> I do not recommend Unbroken. I do recommend Theory of Everything, but later, not in cinema, definitely not in cinema. Mm. If you can, Ida, in cinema, an imitation. Mm -hmm. What are you waiting for? Uh, Go watch it. <laughs> I, unlike you, recommend if you want to have an entertaining night in the movie theater, watch Unbroken. Because it is entertaining and it is good. It is not great, but it is good. Theory of everything, if you're into acting, I guess see it in cinema, but just wait. And that wraps up our first ever review episode. So, just to recap the films we've reviewed today, The Imitation Game. We both gave it a 90% and we both recommend it. Ida, I gave it an 80%, Barney gave it a 70% and we both recommend it. Unbroken. I gave it a very generous 70%. Barnaby gave it a 50%. I say I recommend it. I say it should be watched in cinemas. And Barnaby says it's not worth it. And the theory of everything. We both give it a 60% and we both say you should wait for this. And if you really want to watch it, just rent it if you're really interested in acting. You can find me on my Instagram, Dan Blumensev, which is D-A-N. B-L-U-M-E-N-S-E-V, Dan Blumensev. My website is still coming, so it should be available soon. Please like this video, subscribe if you want to hear more, and pass this on to whoever's interested, and tell your friends about us. Thank you for listening.